So we're going to talk about biology and, and, and how do we figure out what might work as a treatment. Um, as I mentioned before, so I, I'm a physician, you know, a neurologist at Hopkins and a researcher, and I direct a, a postmortem tissue core, an ALS research resource that provides tissues and data to researchers around the world. And um, I'm not going to talk specifically about that effort today. Um, I actually gave a talk about it for another, for a patient group, uh, Everything ALS, um, about a month ago. Um, but I wanted to mention it because, you know, Rick said it's very important to talk, and he's right, about, about your disclosures. And so I spend my week, um, a large portion of it actually, on Zoom. And, and this has been since like 2013, way before the pandemic, because I'm talking to researchers around the world and, and helping to coordinate the use of these resources. But importantly, I, I'm doing this with no strings attached. So these are resources that are provided with no intellectual property, no authorship requirements, no ownership. I don't ask for anything in return. It doesn't fund me. I have confidentiality agreements with lots and lots of pharma companies, but they're not consulting agreements. I don't get anything in return. I don't ask for anything. It's just so that they can talk to me about the research. This program right now is funded um, largely by um, uh, the, the CDC ALS uh, registry, the National ALS registry. And it's thanks to that funding that I'm able to do this without these strings attached and, and really not have those sorts of conflicts. I'm also the programmatic panel chair for the DOD ALS research program, and that is a volunteer position. And it is something that I cherish and would not be able to do if not for the efforts of innumerable uh, people with ALS and caregivers and you know, um, uh, research ambassadors and warriors. And tomorrow we're gonna talk about that program and how in fact you guys are impacting it in every possible way in the vision and the success and, and everything that we do. We're also tomorrow going to talk about, uh, Terry's giving a talk about how to read a research paper. We're also going to briefly talk about how to read a grant. And the reason we're doing that is that you guys asked for it. So as was mentioned, um, you know, we, the DOD calls them consumers, pals and cows, uh, serve every aspect of this program from peer review and programmatic review. And we've been asked to, to kind of do a better job of helping you help us, you know, sort of going through the process of how does one evaluate a grant and how does one decide whether something's worth funding. So we're going to do a little bit of that tomorrow. Um, and so stay tuned. Now, I, I mentioned I gave a talk a month ago for Everything ALS, and that talk was actually about the things that Kevin was, was kind of alluding to. You know, how can we specifically accelerate therapies uh, through this process, get things in the trials faster? Um, this was a slide that I used at the beginning of that talk. And, and this, is, uh, this is Jack Griffin. Jack was the chair of neurology at Hopkins when I visited as a med student and when I was a resident. Um, he's passed away. He was not only the chair at Hopkins, but he also edited this Nature Clinical Practice. And he wrote these editorials in a lot of the editions that I really loved because they were all about, you know, finding work-life balance and accelerating research and things that were important to me. And, and this is one that he wrote. This is the beginning of it. And, you know, he, he talks about, and by the way, I want you to notice this is from 2006, right? So you know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, that he talks about how we were learning so much about the science of neurologic diseases and, and young scientists. And at that time, it was me, right? We're really excited about getting into this field. And yet, nevertheless, there was this palpable restlessness among disease advocacy groups, philanthropists, investigators. And why? Because all this knowledge, all this understanding of the biology just really wasn't translating to treatments. And this wasn't just ALS, this is neurology, right? And, and this was not good. And when I presented this slide a month ago as part of that talk, it's because the rest of this editorial spoke about, you know, um, finding ways to accelerate funding and, and, and models that can help us share data uh, faster and without barriers and, you know, um, get results out and collaborate. And, you know, and that was really what I focused on when I discussed this a month ago. I've been thinking about it since then because it kind of ticks me off, right? That this is 16 years later or whatever. And, and, and you know, honestly, this could have been written today, right? I mean, I think this, these sentiments are things that we all share. And, you know, it, it was bothering me for a couple of weeks. I've, I've realized something and it doesn't, and, and I'm kind of excited about what I've realized. And, and that is the one main difference from then to now is, is exactly what we've been talking about. It's, it's what, you know, Rick was saying, nothing, you know, that we are better together, that, um, that back then when he's talking here about, you know, advocates and, and, and foundations, it was kind of this thing where, where the advocates and the, you know, the patient groups, they were the ones who were supposed to go to Congress and say, give us money. And then the researchers took the money and, and did their thing. 
and you know, and then the patients enrolled in the trials, right? And it, and it wasn't really the sort of partnership that we have now. And especially tomorrow, I'm going to talk about some ways that really it, it's you guys that are moving this forward and, and making it so that it's different than it was back then. So what's the deal, right? So you know, when everybody introduced themselves, um, let's see, Joe and Patricia said that they, you know, you guys had limb onset ALS, right? I think Kevin talked about having um, Bobar onset. Uh, you know, Ed mentioned that there's a gene that, that he was investigated for that we've talked about a little bit. And, and so part of the problem with ALS, as you guys well know, is, is that there's all these different ways that it can present and ways that it can progress and different things that are implicated in causing it, right? And so we know all this information. We know we do a lot of experiments in the lab and cells and mice and IPS, whatever it is. But, you know, somehow all of that information has really failed to translate into successful trials. And so we wonder, you know, are the models we're using in lab, are they, the, are they really a good model for what's going on? Or, or maybe, you know, maybe we're not testing these therapies in the right patients, as we've already been talking about. Maybe we are, but we're not doing it at the right time. And so how can we do a better job of that? How can we, how can we figure out how to get the stuff from the lab to patients and make it work? And, you know, the other part of this equation, and this is really the source of everybody's frustration, and I hear it loud and clear, and I'm right there with you, man, and, and you know, we only have these couple of treatments. They don't work that well. They work a little bit. And, you know, I said we there, and I want to point out that we is, is people with ALS, caregivers, doctors, scientists, like we are all desperate. I don't want to be an ALS expert if I can't treat my patients. Like I'm supposed to talk to you right now about biology, but how can I tell you what's important about the biology when it hasn't translated into therapies? And so this is something that, that we are a team in and, and, you know, we need to do a better job. The other thing that's really important, so I mentioned this interconnected world that we live in, right? So data flies around, data from that's exciting and good, also data that's, you know, more suspicious. Nowadays, we have these things even, so preprints, which I think are a wonderful, wonderful thing that's helping accelerate um, research. So I'm, I'm guessing people on here are familiar, but, you know, Terry tomorrow is going to talk about how to read a journal article. An article that gets published in a journal has been reviewed by other scientists, peer review. And nowadays, Articles are published even before the peer review process, or at least they're put up online, what's called preprints. And this is really helping to accelerate science. And COVID, it really helped get results out there. But, you know, we have to learn how to use preprints, and we have to be educated to understand the significance of very early results and, and, and you know, what they really mean in context and what it means to, um, to review something and critically review it. And that's what Terry's going to help you guys with tomorrow. You know, the way that we're connected makes data travel fast. The, the analogy I always think about is, you know, I have an 18 year old kid. He recently learned how to drive. Once upon a time, everybody was in horse drawn buggies. And then suddenly there were cars and those first cars were really fast compared to those horses, but those first cars blew up and people had to learn how to drive those first cars. And, you know, my kid took driver's ed and he needed driver's ed. And we need to do the equivalent of driver's ed to make sure that we all understand how to you know, critically read and assess this data that's coming at us much faster than before. So when this was in person, this is when I would kind of pick on you guys, right? This is the pop quiz and you're kind of off the hook because it doesn't do so well on, on Zoom. But this is what we're gonna talk about. So, you know, what is ALS? Um, what is this disease? I mean, Rick said at the very beginning, uh, and pardon me if I get this wrong, but I think it's, we know, we know what this is called, but we don't know why it happens, right? That was what originally, you know, your introduction was to this disease. And, and so what is it? What do we mean when we say a patient has ALS? How do we diagnose it? What causes it? And what do we know about what causes it? And then how do we look for treatments? How do we decide that something like AMX035 is something we should even have in a clinical trial? Like, where did that come from? Why is that in a trial and not something else? Why have all these trials failed? And, and, and what do we learn when they fail? Like, do we always know why they fail? And this is the key thing, right? Because trials cost tons of money. And so industry pharma talks about de-risking their investments. If I owned a pharma company and they were like, hey, do you want to develop drugs for ALS or some other disease? You know, I would be leery because these trials fail and they cost a lot of money. And so we need to be able to de-risk the investment of industry so that they are eager to conduct these trials and fund them. And you know, again, always, how can we do better than we're doing? And how do these questions help inform um, uh, our road forward? So question one, what is ALS, right? What does it really mean? If I, if, you know, everybody who, who's 
participating in this, th those of you who have ALS or who've had family members with ALS, what does that mean? And you know, in the simplest sense, ALS is a disease of progressive weakness, right? It can start anywhere. As we talked about sometimes it can start in a limb, it can start in breathing muscles, it can start more than one place. And it then gradually spreads and it spreads throughout the body. And you know, ALS is a fatal disease. Why is it fatal? Because when it involves the muscles that are, are breathing muscles or swallowing muscles, maybe you get you know, pneumonia if you can't clear your secretions or you aspirate some food into your lungs or you can't get nutrition. But, but it's a disease at its root of, of gradually progressive weakness. In some people it goes fast and some slow. There's some interesting unique things about it so um, that are different than other nerve and muscle diseases perhaps. One of them is that it generally spares the, the muscles that control our bowels and bladder. Another is that it generally, at least until very late in disease, um, uh, spares the muscles that control eye movements. And some patients who get ALS also develop a kind of dementia and that this is more common with certain genetic types of the disease. But here's the point, right? This is a clinical diagnosis, okay? There's no blood test. There's no, you know, it's not like I can check your blood pressure and say your blood pressure is high, so you have high blood pressure or take your blood and say your sugars are high in your blood, so you've got diabetes. This is, this is a diagnosis that is based on a clinical exam. So what's going on in the body, you know, that, that and, and what is the system that we're talking about? And so these, I mean, you guys probably remember from even high school, right? So, you know, the right side of your brain controls the left side of your body, left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. Your brain's got all this cool stuff in different places that help you see and smell and think and remember things and move and feel things. And, and you know, all that stuff is in different places. And so this is a picture of a brain, right? This is the front of the brain. This is the back of the brain. So this is somebody looking this way. And there's this strip here in the brain, it's called the primary motor cortex. And in that part of the brain, um, there's this representation of your body, right? This is called the homunculus. And so different parts of this little strip control the different muscles in the different parts of your body. And then there's neurons, right? These are the nerve cells. They're the longest freaking neurons in your body. They come, so this is a cut through this brain right here. It's like a cut, right? Through like that, right? And so this pink part here is this same strip here. And these neurons, they come down, they come in the middle of the brain, they go through the what's called the brain stem that connects the brain to the um, spinal cord. And then they cross over and then they go in this little part of the spinal cord. And by the way, your spinal cord, which is what goes down, you know, this thing here to go out to the muscles, your whole spinal cord is, is like no thicker than, than my pen here. Whoever designed it wasn't a very good design, but, um, but everything that your spinal cord is transmitting, not just motor, it's in a very, very thin little tube. And it's in a part of that thin little tube that these nerves come down. And then they come down and then they actually, once they get where they wanna be, they touch another nerve. So this red line touches the blue line. That other nerve leaves the spinal cord and goes out to your muscles. And this is you know, the upper motor neuron, right? And by the way, this is called the cortical spinal tract because this is your cortex of your brain, which is the outer covering of your brain. So cortex down through your spinal cord, the cortical spinal tract. And then it touches the lower motor neuron and the lower motor neuron goes out to your muscle and tells your muscle to move. This picture on the bottom right here, this is a cut through the, the, the cervical spinal cord, this thing that's the thickness of my pen, right? And so the, the parts here, this is the cortical spinal tract, you know, it's this little part. I just wanna point out, look at all this other stuff, like look at all these words, right? This is like all other stuff in the spinal cord. And so one of the interesting things about ALS, right, is that it's just these pathways that are affected. It's these upper and lower motor neurons and not all this other stuff. And so, you know, whatever these cell processes are that are going on, somehow they're not, they're not causing problems for all the other information that's traveling here. You know, as we said, ALS is a clinical diagnosis. Well, there is stuff going on in the brain and the spinal cord, but of course we can't, you know, biopsy somebody's brain during life and we don't need to because we can diagnose it clinically. But again, this is that same picture as before. If we look, so in the spinal cord, this is a, a cut, a section of a person's spinal cord. And you see how this is pale right here, right? So this is an ALS patient, this is a control patient, and this is pale because the cells in the ALS that are in that tract, they're missing, they've kind of gone. This purple here, this is a, a microscope picture looking under a microscope at this part right here where the, the upper and the lower motor neuron touch each other. And that little blue dot there, that's the cell body of this lower motor neuron. That's these little blue dots. And so can you see that there's less of them here in the ALS patient because they've died, right? So there's blue dots here, the blue dots are less here in ALS. And so 
you know, this is what's going on in the spinal cord as this disease progresses. If we look out at the muscle, when a muscle loses its nerve, what we call denervated, this is normal muscle. If I cut through a section of your muscle, the, it's got this kind of cobblestone appearance to it. If we look at an ALS muscle, denervated muscle, the muscle fibers become really thin and pointy. And so this is, these are the changes that are going on in your tissues as the disease progresses. So, you know, how does a neurologist, this is a question too, right? How do we diagnose it? And we mentioned it's a clinical exam. So when a neurologist meets somebody, the first thing we're doing when we meet you, we're not saying, do you have ALS or Parkinson's disease or MS or, you know, a chip that aliens are controlling you? I mean, we're not trying to figure out what the diagnosis is at first. The first thing we're trying to do is figure out if we can tell what part of your nervous system might be affected, localize the problem, right? And, and so we, we're, we're examining you, we're taking history, we're also listening very close to the tempo, okay? Because, you know, there's lots of things that can cause weakness. Now, if you have a stroke and, and maybe you can't move some part of your body, that's a weakness that comes on much faster than the sort of gradually progressive weakness of something like ALS. But what we're doing when we examine you is, is trying to figure out what part of the nervous system might be wrong. And then after that, we're saying, okay, are there tests that we can now order, something like an EMG or an MRI, something that's going to help us maybe confirm that our localization is correct. And then we think about what the disease is. So this, this is my simple version of that other picture that um, I showed you that was so complicated and, you know, this thing, right? So this is your brain, this is your spinal cord, and this is your muscle. And you've got nerves up in your brain and they come down through your spinal cord, they touch other nerves, they go out and move your muscle. And when somebody has weakness, you can have weakness because of... as problem anywhere along here. You can have a stroke in your brain. You can have arthritis in your neck. You can have a muscle disease like kids with muscular dystrophies or people who take a cholesterol medicine and get, get a kind of you know muscle weakness from that. You can have a disease because of a problem where the muscle and nerve touch each other. That's, for example, myasthenia gravis, and the communication is messed up here. If I draw a line through this picture right here, so where this upper motor neuron meets the lower motor neuron, if the problem's on this side of the picture, the muscle, where they connect, the nerve coming out of the spinal cord, we see certain things on exam. We see the little twitches, vesiculations, muscle atrophy, loss of muscle bulk, okay, decreased reflexes, weakness. If the problem's on this side of the picture, you know, the brain or the spinal cord, we see different things on exam. We see spasticity, increased tone, right? Trouble moving your limbs because they're spastic. We see increased reflexes. Some people get this, you know, pseudobulbar affect, trouble controlling their emotions. And so these are the things that help us localize where a problem might be in someone. And ALS is a unique disease because ALS is really the only disease where you have this progressive, gradual, worsening weakness, and you have both upper and lower motor neuron signs. And if you wanted to, you know, point your finger to somewhere in this picture to cause that, you point your finger to where these two things meet, right? If you wanted to cause a problem here and here. And that's the anterior horn cell. That's that's the you know the lower motor neuron cell bodies. This is the part of your nervous system that's affected uh, in ALS, and it's how we make the diagnosis: is seeing these signs and not seeing problems with all that other stuff that's in the spinal cord and the brain and in different regions. So, what causes ALS? You know, again, Rick said we know what this is called, but we're not sure why it happens. Well, as as I think most people on this call know. About 10% of ALS we say is familial, meaning that there's either a family history or a specific gene that it's linked to. 90% of the time, we don't know. You know, it's really unknown. Um, and there's many possible uh, causes that are interacting in those cases. Th this is a figure from 2015. What this is showing, so this is numbers of genes associated with ALS, right? And then this is the years that this has been going on. And so all these different things on here, these are different genes that, that were discovered that can cause ALS. And the size of these circles tells you um, how important they are, like how common they are. So C9ORF is the most common gene. It's the biggest circle. The second most common one is SOD1. And, and so, by the way, if you step back and just think about this, it's kind of weird, right, that I just explained that there's this very specific disease that progresses a certain way that is really easy to recognize clinically. And yet look at all these different genes that can cause it. There's a whole lot of them, Okay. And it even gets worse than that. So, so Dr. Harms made this figure for me. Um, uh, he's you know, one of our genetics gurus in ALS. And, and what this is showing is that that paper was in 2015. Since then, we've even added a bunch more genes and we keep adding more genes as, as we get different ways to study genetics. And, and so again, there's a whole lot of different genes um, that all can cause this very specific disease. That's weird. 
You know, how can all these individual things cause this very specific disease? I, I want to point something else out about this timeline here. So um, the very first gene in ALS, SOD1, was discovered in 1993, right? This was our first mutation, okay? By 1994, we had an animal model, meaning that somebody figured out that if you put this mutation, this SOD mutation that we find in people into a mouse, that mouse develops what looks like the human ALS. And, and to this day, this is the most common and well-studied mouse model that's used in a lab as a model of ALS to try drugs, to try different therapies, um, is these mice. And, and so this was 1993, they had a mouse model in 1994. Rhizol, the first drug, look at that, 95. Okay, Rhizol actually wasn't tested in these mice. Um, but, but that being said, can you imagine back then, like they must have thought, hey, we're gonna have this ALS thing kicked in like a year or two, because we got our gene and we got our model and now we got a drug and we're off to the races. And so, you know, what's happened and, and, and why hasn't that been the case? And also, so again, these genes are still only accounting for 10% of the cases. And so there's another 90% that, that, you know, we call sporadic, um, that we don't actually know what causes them. And then we get to this, right? And so there's a lot of different cells and pathways that have been implicated in ALS. It's nuts. That picture on the right is supposed to be me because it makes my head explode. And I can only imagine that I'm not alone in that, right? And, and so that picture in the middle here, so this is a motor neuron. That's the motor nerve cell, but we've learned it's not even just a problem with the motor neurons. All these other cells that are in the, in the brain or in the body also can have abnormalities that cause ALS. And look at this, this is a list of just some of the things that have been implicated in causing ALS. Remember how I said there's a lot of different genes? Look how long this list is, and these are just some examples. And don't just look at how long it is, look at what they are, okay? Mitochondrial dysfunction, right? Mitochondria, you guys have heard of those, right? The powerhouse of the cell. I, I think every cell in my body has mitochondria. I think every nerve in my body has an axon, you know, endoplasmic reticulum, protein, oxidative stress. These are very general cell mechanisms that virtually every cell in my body uses. And so how is it that there's this huge long list of all these general cell mechanisms that all have been implicated in ALS? And, and oh, by the way, problems in these things can cause other diseases too, like sleep apnea or prostate cancer or dementia. And so what makes ALS ALS? How does this happen? And we're gonna talk about where this list came from in a second. I, I first wanna just point out one of the people I blame is, is Kristalina, Olivia, not really, but um, uh, this is a review that she wrote in 2009. And, and, and this was a review specifically about what I was just talking about, that it's not even just the motor neurons. There's other cells that are involved. And look at this picture. This is like an OHEL picture, right? It's a great illustration. But, you know, even back 2009, we understood that all these different things could potentially be abnormal in, in an ALS patient. Um, I want to point out, so she, you know, she mentioned she was at Hopkins. She did, was a fellow with us. She wrote this, um, she was a scientist and then a fellow. And so she's you know, really a, just a benchmark sort of clinician scientist now to understand all this stuff. But this is not new. Like we've known that there were all these mechanisms for a while. And, and the part that's frustrating is not understanding perhaps the selective vulnerability. Why is it that in somebody who develops ALS, you know, that all these different causes can cause this specific disease? So where does those lists come from? Where does these figures come from? How do we say that these are all things that can cause ALS? How do we know all those genes can cause ALS? And so it gets back to how we actually do research in a lab, right? And it's pretty straightforward and pretty easy to understand, I think. So you've got your disease and you've got your normal and you compare them, right? So your apple to your orange. And you know sometimes it's really easy to tell. Like I can tell that's an apple, that's an orange. It looks very different, okay? Sometimes it might not be so clear. So, may, so maybe, you know, you've got two different types of apples and you can't tell them apart, but maybe if I ground this apple up and did an analysis, I find that it has more sugar or more, you know, some other chemical or um, something on the inside is different. Sometimes if you're comparing your disease to normal, maybe, maybe even that's not enough. Maybe you need some like sexy imaging study or special way to analyze it, right? So, you know, these are MRI scans. That's a peach, that's a pomegranate. I have no idea why somebody did this, but it's cool. Right. But, you know, in lab, what we're doing is we're trying to look at something that we think represents our disease, whether it's a cell, whether it's an animal, we're comparing our, our disease to our normal, looking for differences, looking for things that we can adjust that might be relevant. So we do that in cells, we do that in tissues, we do that in mice. This is an example of how you might compare mice, right? So this is that mouse I mentioned, that SOD mouse, the one that was, you know, discovered in, in 1994, and, and we still use it for trials. So, so these are all litter mates from one mom that were born at the same time. The ones on the left here were given a, a placebo and the ones on the right got a drug, right? And it doesn't matter what the drug is. But, you know, 
if you look at this, you'd be like, ah, that looks pretty cool. They, oops, sorry. That, you know, the, the ones over here that got the drug, they, they seem to be walking around a lot better. Like, you know, these guys here aren't moving so much. But, but if you really look for a sec, you might notice that guy just fell over. Like, one of these is maybe moving a little better, and, and maybe some of these aren't. And, you know, some of these are even different colored mice, and some of them look big, and some of them look small. And so does this really matter? And, and is this the drug? And is this statistically significant? And tomorrow, you're going to get a lecture about statistics and research and how to think about this stuff. Um, you know, is it possible? I mentioned these are all litter mates. So, so Terry has been one of the people who's been very interested. We've learned if you breed these mice on different, what are called backgrounds, different genetic species, they behave differently. And originally people were like, oh, this is an artifact. This is terrible. It's screwing up our results. But, but Terry's actually said, well, hey, on a second. Like, why is that happening? Why have I breed this mice on a different background? Why does it live longer? And maybe there's something there, a genetic modifier that can help us figure out a way to treat ALS. But in any case, it, it's not as simple as you'd like it to be. And, and, you know, we often hear about like a trial where maybe one, some patients did really well with the drug, maybe some didn't, right? Maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe these siblings, you know, maybe it's the drug, but maybe it's not. Maybe it's related to a, a different thing in their genetics or, or who knows. And so we have to be very careful and rigorous about how we design and interpret these experiments. And again, this is that one type of ALS, that SOD mutation. So is this something that's useful for a somebody who doesn't have that mutation. Okay, this is my house. Um, <laughs> Joe, I think you said you were a real estate agent, right? So uh, I moved here in 2013. It's way out in the country. It had been vacant for like four years and it was completely destroyed. And it's one of those ones like our real estate agent refused to show it to us. They're like, oh no, that's an interesting house. We don't, we don't like to look at those. And, you know, it had been on the market for years. It was a mess, um, which is the only reason we could afford it. And it had broken windows and like mold in the basement and a broken heater. But we bought it, even though neither our real estate agent or our parents wanted us to, and we fixed it up and we love it. And you know, it's our oasis. Um, and then that first year that we lived there, it was like really cold. And we learned that this house that's, by the way, it's made of two foot thick stone, right? And it was built in the forties and it's the draftiest house you've ever been in. And so if you didn't know what made a house drafty, you didn't know what made a house in the winter cold and you were comparing, you said, let's compare my house to the house next door. Let's see if we can figure out what's different you know, that maybe we can treat why this house is drafty. I'll tell you what, the first thing you'd probably notice if you didn't understand, you know, how the heating worked was that we had a lot of ash in our fireplaces because we burned fires all the time, right? And it's interesting because a lot of the things that we look at in under the microscope in ALS or in other diseases of the brain or really any organ, they're sort of kind of maybe ash in a fireplace or that, or they look like that. So this is a picture of a, of a nerve cell body and the middle part's the nucleus. And this is a stain of a particular single protein, right? Just one thing that happens to be there. Normally it's in the nucleus like this. And in this disease, in ALS, this thing gets out of the nucleus and is all over in the cytoplasm, right? And, and look, it looks sort of spotty. And then it actually forms these goofy looking like stringy dingy things, okay? And, and so the question is, is that screwing something up, right? Is that, maybe it's supposed to do something in the nucleus and maybe it's not doing it because it's trapped out here and, and can't get back in. Or, or maybe it's doing something bad out here. Or you guys know, like there's all sorts of stuff in your cells, right? Like all different kinds of organelles, right? It's kind of hard to imagine that having all this junk in here isn't screwing that up. So, so what's going on? Is this just ash in the fireplace? Or is this doing something bad? And so this is actually a picture of, of TDP43. You guys might've heard of this. It's, it's one of these, these proteins that is implicated. It's found these abnormal inclusions in ALS um, in a large portion of ALS. It's actually kind of the thing we see most commonly in, in most forms of ALS. You know, it's interesting, the one kind of ALS that this classic pathological finding isn't found in is that SOD ALS, the one that we have our mouse from that's been the mouse we've used forever and ever is the one, you know, is the most commonly studied mouse. In any case, in the case of TDP43, we do think we understand that it is not just ash in the fireplace, that it's doing something bad. It actually is not doing what it's supposed to do in the nucleus and potentially doing something bad out in the cytoplasm. So, but that, but to be clear, there are lots of instances where in different diseases and in ALS, we always wonder is what we're seeing an artifact or something that's you know, just ash in the fireplace or is it causative? Now, when we first moved into this house, we burned a lot of fires. We stopped doing that because we actually learned that um, it, cooled down our house. It made it warm right around the fireplace, but it sucked in drafts from everywhere else. This is the furnace in my house, okay? And, and this is the oil tank outside. We have an oil furnace. We live way out in the country. This is a plunger that says how much oil there is, and it's empty. And this is a picture I took in the middle of the night because we were freezing because we ran out of oil. If you compared my house to the house next door, we burn a lot more oil. 
right? If you concluded that the problem is that I need to burn less oil, that's not going to help me. That's the opposite of going to help me. My furnace is fine. It's a great furnace. It doesn't have a defect that I'm aware of, but I guarantee that we get it serviced more, that it breaks down more than my neighbor's furnace because we use it a lot more. It's interesting that that list that I showed you, a lot of those pathways are things that are involved basically in energy movement, right? I showed you how those neurons are super long cells. They go all the way from the brain, all the way down the spinal cord. You can imagine that takes a lot of energy. It's maybe not surprising that when we compare you know, ALS cells to non-ALS cells, that a lot of the stuff that falls out is perhaps related to moving energy or providing energy. So is that the problem or is that is that the furnace working overtime? So you know, the point is that, that, again, ALS is a clinical diagnosis. We know that there's a lot of different abnormalities that we can observe in cells and models. And we think that there's different flavors of ALS because in some patients, in some different disease models, in some mutations, some of these things seem to be more prominent. In you know, some patients, it might be a problem with SOD1. In some patients, it might be a problem with the furnace. In some patients, it might be a problem with you know, um, uh, some other protein. And so a lot of efforts right now are focused on figuring out, can we identify subsets? Can we figure out are there different flavors of ALS that, that we can tell and we can give the right treatments to the right patients? You know, ideally, you'd like to address the underlying abnormality. We talked about this idea of having these genetics, these rare genes, and you'd like to be able to specifically address them or, or something that's specifically wrong. For a lot of ALS, we still don't understand um, what that might be. We also don't understand how all these broad mechanisms and mutations and everything else can cause this specific disease. So in my house, what's my genetic mutation? It's these windows. We have house made of two foot thick stone and we have these single pane 1940s steel sash windows and I can't replace them because they're in two foot thick stone and it would be a real huge expense you know genetic therapy is expensive and it would be really hard and almost impossible and not much I can really do about it genetic therapy is becoming easier by the way as, as you guys know at least in ALS so here's one treatment so this was my father-in-law um you know because my in-laws he's passed away but when they would visit us every Christmas every year and um, go from room to room and turn the heat up. And we would follow them and turn the heat down because we were burning like $80 of oil every day. And so our treatment that we decided was that we bought him these hilarious infomercial footy pajamas, right? This did not affect my windows. This didn't treat the abnormality in my house. But guess what? This was a good treatment because it made him not feel the cold, okay? And it also had a side effect as some medicines do that it made him look hilarious, which you know was good for the rest of us. This is not so different from some things that are in ALS trials. So, you know, right now there's the, the Courage ALS trial of, of rel deceptive, And before that, there was tear So, so this is a, these are drugs that are not slowing down ALS, not stopping ALS, not doing anything like that. What they're doing is helping to improve the efficiency of the remaining innervated muscle fibers, right? And so they're not unlike these footy pajamas. They're, they're helping the remaining muscle work more efficiently. That study I showed you, those pictures of those mice running around. So that's a study that I'm, I've been actually involved with. It's another muscle, muscle study. It's, a, it's not specific to ALS. What it is, is that there's this, this chemical and the chemical is involved in repairing the membrane of the muscle. So if a, if a nerve, so you've got the nerve, the nerve goes to the muscle. If a muscle loses its nerve, it starts to degenerate. And this chemical is involved in repairing that. And so it kind of slows down that degeneration as this process is going on. Again, not specific to ALS, any muscle that's denervated, this protein is involved in repairing it. That treatment of those mice was giving them extra of this stuff, okay? Those mice walking around, this is the kind of, when Terry shows you how to, you know, reading papers, this is the sort of data that you might do in an experiment like that. So these are computer generated graphs showing how much the mice are walking around. Each of these lines is a mouse, right? And so this is the one that was the placebo and there's like less walking, this is more walking. You know, this is some other data showing you, again, these are statistics, you're gonna learn about this tomorrow, some of these error bars, but this is showing you that this membrane repair can be measured and can be improved by a drug. Look at this, this is saying something serum level, who cares what this is, but I wonder. So, so this is because even at this early basic science stage, we're already thinking about what might we be able to measure in a patient as a biomarker to know if we're having an effect, to know if our therapy is doing what we want it to do. These are the kinds of curves that you see in a lot of treatment trials of ALS. So this is, these are actually ways to look at the mouse and how they're being treated. So the red line is the placebo and the black line is the drug. And this is looking at the, the weight of the mice, right? And there's like 13 mice in each group in this one. And so over time with ALS, the mice usually lose weight and that's slowed down if they get the drug. 
This is looking at mouse survival. So 100% of the mice are surviving, you know, 60% are surviving. Each of these drops is a, is a mouse that's not surviving. And with the drug, the length of time and days is increased, right? So can I tell you that this works? Absolutely not. This is an early paper. This is something that is you know, not specific to ALS. And this is just one study and one mouse model. Um, but it's one of these, you know, lots of therapies that is under development um, as a potential, you know, treatment for ALS. And, and you'll see. So what happens? Like, why have so many trials failed, right? And I'm going to use a specific example. So ceftriaxone, this was several years ago now. But this was a drug that there was a lot of money invested in this development, in the basic science, in assays, in the lab, in translating. And see this picture down here? That looks like those pictures I just showed you, right? So this is the same mouse, that same SOD1 mouse that we've been using forever. This is survival. This is how long they survived. And the mice that got the drug survived longer. And so it seemed to work in the mice. And, and it came out of this screen of a bunch of different drugs. And without worrying about what the science is, it had this specific mechanism. It was supposed to be upregulating this specific protein, turning something up in a, in a kind of cell. When this came to clinical trials, there were, there were uh, phase two trials um, where it seemed to work. And then it failed miserably in phase three. And like miserably, stopped early, didn't do anything, tons of money wasted, and, and it failed. And so why did it fail? You know, did it fail because it was a bad idea that this, this idea about how it was supposed to work maybe just wasn't true, or maybe it was only true for a subset of patients, or maybe the drug didn't get there. It didn't cross this barrier between your blood and, and your spinal fluid and your brain in high enough quantities to have the effect it was supposed to have, or maybe it got there, but it didn't do enough of what it was supposed to do. And the problem is we don't know. And, and now that all this money was spent and this trial failed, like nobody's going to touch this. And, and maybe it's a good treatment. And maybe if we knew these things, if we'd had a way to track the thing that it was supposed to be affecting, we could have answered that question. We didn't have it. We didn't have a way to know during that trial. And so this is where biomarkers come in. And, and you guys hear about biomarkers a lot. This is not new. This is a press release from a talk or from a meeting in 2014 that was hosted by the ALS Association. And it's talking about that we need things that measure, you know, response to drugs. Um, we weren't so savvy about it back then. We didn't understand the language or, or really how to talk about them that much. We've gotten better, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute. But the point was that pharma companies don't want to spend a lot of money if they don't have a way to know that these, you know, what's going on when they do these trials, whether the drugs are even reaching their target. I also want to just mention that, you know, nowadays we are doing all these omics studies and taking all these samples and measuring all these different sorts of genetics and proteins and everything else. And you have to be a little bit careful because you'll find correlations that don't necessarily relate to what you're doing. This is a website that's fun to go play on. If you're curious, it mines publicly available data sets and you can make your own comparisons between them from different publicly available sets. And so this is, you know, the U.S. Census divorce rate in Maine and USDA consumption of margarine, right? And look at that. That's like better than most benchtop experiments. Correlation 0.99. Okay, I don't think that those things are related to each other. This is my favorite one ever on this website. This is the per capita consumption of cheese from the USDA over this decade and um, people who die by becoming tangled in their bed sheets from the CDC. Now, again, beautiful correlation. Maybe they're related. Maybe like you get really gassy if you eat a lot of cheese and because you got really gassy, you flip around in your bed. I have no idea. Um, uh, but just kind of makes the point that when we're measuring so many different things from so many people, the correlations will fall out. They don't necessarily have to be the cause of the disease to be useful, but you have to be careful. So it turns out there's actually lots of different kinds of biomarkers. And Michael Banatar, Dr. Banatar gave me these, these figures. And so thank you to him. You know, um, so this is the first kind of biomarker we sometimes talk about. So this is something that you measure in a patient and it's up. And in somebody who doesn't have a disorder, it's not up, right? This is your blood pressure or your you know, your sugar, if you have diabetes. And, and so what do we call this? This is a diagnostic biomarker. It helps you make a diagnosis. Believe it or not, this is not really our biggest need in ALS. Yes, we'd like to make the diagnosis earlier. We'd like to be able to know, you know, and start treatments earlier. It's not our greatest need. We're, we're not bad at recognizing it um, compared to some of these other biomarkers that we could use. So there's trials right now of, you know, treatments for people who have SOD mutations. Those were talked about earlier on this call. And if you have a trial of a drug that's specific for an SOD mutation, you don't want to enroll people who don't have that mutation, right? And so you do a gene test beforehand and you say, this is somebody who should get this drug. And, and so that's what we call a predictive biomarker, right? It predicts who might respond to a therapy, but it's not just for genetics. If I have a drug, AMX035, or let's say a drug that just affects mitochondria, right? I'd like to know which 
patients I should give it to? Are there patients who have more you know, problems with their mitochondria or more problems with inflammation or more problems with whatever it is that my drug is targeting, you know, people who are more likely to respond to the drug. And so predictive biomarkers help us select the right patients for the right drugs. So this is a different kind of biomarker. This is one where you have, so a measurement that you make one time and you either have a high amount of it or a low amount of it that one time and that predicts how you're gonna do over time. So how are you going, if you have a high amount, this blue line, maybe you're more likely to survive. If you have a low amount, maybe you're less likely to survive, or maybe this is function, let's say muscle strength, maybe your weakness progresses more quickly. And so something you measure that helps you understand um, somebody's prognosis, are they a fast progressor or a slow progressor? And so this is what we call a prognostic biomarker. And this kind of thing can help us match cohorts in a trial, right? Because we want to be able to know that the people that are in our, our treatment and our placebo group look like each other and progress at the same rate and, and what to expect from them. This is the one that we really need. So, so this is something that you measure, let's say in blood or spinal fluid. Each of these lines is a person. And let's say it's stable, but then you give a treatment and it goes down. Or maybe it's something that over time is going up and then you give a treatment and it stops going up. And so something that your treatment changed about a patient. So this is what we really need. This is called a pharmacodynamic biomarker, right? Something that changes with our treatment. The problem is until we have treatments that are effective, it's tough to say what's a meaningful pharmacodynamic measure. However, what we really need are measures that reflect the pathways of the drugs. If I have a drug that's targeting a specific cellular pathway, you know, I mentioned that ceftriaxone trial. If I had something that had shown me that it did the, the biological thing it was supposed to do, that would have been helpful. That would have helped me know, you know, that the drug had an effect. So as it turns out, we actually have a lot of different biomarker candidates in ALS, and you guys hear about them a lot, I think, too. And so what do we need to do to make them ready for a clinical trial? And, you know, it was mentioned earlier, this idea about how none of this could be done without patients because we need these samples and we need rigorous data along with the samples and the data has to be collected the same way and mean the same thing. So this was a study that I, that I, uh, I helped design with, with Michael Benatar again, who runs the CREATE Consortium, one of these efforts that collects all these samples and data. And, and what we did, so this neurofilament, which is one of these measures you guys might hear about, neurofilament is something that if a nerve dies, it squirts it out, right? And so if more nerves are dying, it's gonna be higher. And if less nerves are dying, it's gonna be lower. And so, um, we took these samples from this cohort of all these patients, and we found every assay that measures neurofilament commercially available. And we wanted to make sure that if these were done in different people's hands and different commercial assays, like did it get the same results and how reliable was the test? What did we have to do to make sure that it was gonna be the same when it was tested over and over? So we sent all these samples to all these different companies. This looks like that picture I just showed you. So I measure something one time. And if you have a low level, you, your probability of surviving is higher than if you have a high level. And so this is an example of a predictive biomarker. And this is how we proved it with neurofilament. So this is the thing though, like we not only need those samples, but you got to understand. So if, if cells are, are apples, right? And if I grind up cells in a lab, I'm making applesauce, okay? But tissues like apple pie, right? Because there's different kinds of cells in there. And as the disease progresses, I showed you that some of the cells die. So the ratio of apples to sugar to whatever else is in your pie changes as the disease progresses. And if I'm measuring something in the blood or measuring something in the spinal fluid, that's like this melty stuff that's coming out on the plate here, okay? So is that melty stuff on the plate reflective of what's going on? Or maybe is it reflective of, of less cells or cells that have changed? And it's even a little bit worse than that because you know we measure things in spinal fluid, right? So even if the amount of cells um, that are secreting something in the spinal fluid goes up or goes down, the spinal fluid itself can change because your body regulates it. Your body regulates the concentration of proteins in your spinal fluid. You remake your entire spinal fluid three times a day. If you're dehydrated, that happens differently. There's all these mechanisms that's called the blood-brain barrier to, to change and regulate the levels of these things. So even if the levels are changing in a dish in a lab, or in applesauce, or you know that we can see a difference when we compare two kinds of apples. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be able to detect that when we look in the stuff that's you know in the fluids that have come out of the apple pie. So what was my involvement in that study that, that I mentioned before? My involvement was that it used muscle samples from this postmortem core. These are the mouse muscle. This is human muscle. This is diaphragm muscle, right? So the mouse was an SOD mouse, 
But this is muscle samples from sporadic ALS. This is muscle samples from a different genetic form of ALS, nine. And see these like spotty junk, right? So the normal mice don't have it. The wild type mice have spotty junk. And, and, and that's actually the stain for the specific protein. And we saw it across all these different kinds of ALS. So maybe this is a therapy that might end up working for different types of ALS, we'll see. But at least we showed that it's not just an SOD and it's not just in the mice. I'm gonna skip through this because I'm already talking too much, but just to say that there's interest right now in muscle biopsy as a, as a way to monitor diseases, because although I can't cut your brain out during life, I can take a sample of your muscle and this is done for a lot of um, uh, disorders already. And in fact, if, if anybody, so the Helix Smith trial that um, has just been ongoing in ALS used pre and post treatment muscle biopsies as ways to look at biomarkers. And yeah, I'm gonna skip through this, but um, we actually, so I do the diagnostic biomarkers or bi muscle biopsies at Hopkins. And another thing we do, not for ALS, but for lots of diseases, well, for anything really, is we take muscle out and we transplant it into mice. And so we end up with human muscle in mice and mice that have a immune system so they don't reject it. And we can use this to study human diseases in a mouse and we can look at what it secretes in the blood of the mouse and we can give the mouse treatments. And it's a way to do a clinical treatment with human samples. We can compare it to the pathology. Um, uh, interestingly enough, this is a study not in ALS. It's in a different disease called IBM, but look at this. And this was just published. It's using that same TDP43 protein. And we were able to show that, that in these mouse, what are called xenografts, we can see these same changes. And we don't see them if we put normal muscle into the mouse's leg. So this is a way for us to develop treatments, to test therapies, to develop biomarkers um, in the lab that hopefully are gonna help us run more efficient clinical trials. As another example, so again with TDP43, this is a company that was getting um, uh, from our postmortem core, we, we provided them with eye tissue because they've learned they have a way to detect TDP43 in your eyes by shining this fancy thing in your eye. Um, and I hope you're going to hear more about this soon as a biomarker without having to cut anything out of you or measure anything uh, by looking in your eye. Well, the woman who did those mouse studies I showed you, the MG53, Dr. Zhu, so she's, she's the person who led those studies. She's recently done the comparison where she looks at what's different about certain muscles in ALS versus not ALS, those eye muscles that I told you aren't involved. And, and in mice, she's found some specific differences that might be treatments. And so we've gone back to Amidas and, and we're, we're saying to them, hey, we gave you those eyeballs for your studies. We kind of like the muscles back because now we can use them maybe to help figure out you know, this kind of treatment. So this is the way that we efficiently can, can develop these treatments. So the last thing I want to mention, you know, I teach the graduate students at Hopkins, the neuroscience graduate students about ALS. I give them a lecture um, about all the biology. And, and, you know, I want them to be thinking when they're in their lab doing very basic, early basic science, what's going to be the biomarker eventually in their clinical trials? This is the exam question that I give every year. It's an essay question for this, for the students. I ask them, you know, to, to, give me some mechanisms or alternatively, just propose an entirely novel mechanism, some new idea of something that might cause ALS, design a laboratory experiment to identify a therapy, and then tell me how you're gonna find a biomarker. How are you gonna develop a biomarker for eventual clinical trials? Something to predict who's gonna respond, something to monitor whether somebody replies. I, I love, I get the most amazing things back from these students. I this, gave this lecture about a month ago and I've got 42 essays to grade still, but. Um, but this is the way we can get scientists thinking about this stuff earlier. So the last slide I have, and stay tuned. So, you know, the one nice thing about Zoom is we don't have to worry about Jamie, like making everybody stay out late tonight and, you know, having parties with all you guys and whatever he does in the hotel. You get a good night's sleep tonight, okay? Um, get ready, have, you know, do whatever you got to do tomorrow. Um, we're going to talk about the, the CDMRP, the ALS Research Program. We're gonna talk about how to review a grant proposal. We're gonna talk about how none of this could be done in, without you guys. And in specifically how the impact you are having that is really changing this landscape and accelerating these processes. Uh, and I just put up on here and we can talk about it tomorrow that we have, have you know, specifically because of work of PALS and CALS identifying these, these issues and these barriers, we have redefined and, and reorganized our funding mechanisms to try and help accelerate the development of therapies that truly work based on biomarkers, based on well-designed experiments. So that's it. Thanks, guys.